Hello statistics students, this is Janie Amy and this video is our discussion on 6.3 and 6.4. Section 6.3 is on sampling distributions and estimators. We know that there is a difference between a population parameter and a sample statistic. So before we move on, I want you to test yourself and make sure you know what the different symbols are. Uh, if you don't keep track of your symbols, then next thing you know you're buried in different Greek letters and symbols and it's hard to find your way out of it. So pause this video now and see how many of the eight blanks below you can fill in. Okay, welcome back and grade your own. For sample mean, if you put this symbol, great job, you got it right, and that symbol is red, X bar. For population mean, if you put this symbol, great job, that symbol is red, mu. For sample standard deviation, lowercase s. For population standard deviation, if you put this symbol, you got it right, and that is red sigma, so the lowercase Greek sigma. Uh, sample variance would be lowercase s squared. Population variance would be sigma squared. If you got 100% so far, give yourself a hand. Sample proportion we haven't talked about as much, and that's this symbol here, which is red p hat. And finally, the population proportion is P without the hat on top. Sample means, sample variances, and sample proportions are unbiased estimators. What that means is we can calculate a statistic based on a sample mean, sample variance, sample proportion, and we could then use that that mean or that standard deviation, whatever that statistic is that we uh, calculated, we can use it to make a projection about the population parameter or a prediction or a target, if you will. That is not the same case for medians, ranges, standard deviations. These are what we call bias estimators and you do not want to use them to target the population parameters. Um, I do want to note, though, that the bias with standard deviations is very small, so we will often use a lowercase s to um, predict what sigma might be. So how is it that we can use the mean from just a sample and target an entire population's mean? We have a visual on one example um, why that works out. The procedure here is to roll a die five times and find the X bar for each sample. So the first time you do this procedure, you get 3.4 as your sample mean. Then you get X bar equals 4.4. Then you get X bar is 2.8. Well, we know that the population mean is 3.5. So how will X bar target this mu of 3.5? Well, if you repeat this procedure in, um, enough times, and you graph your outcomes, you'll find that the majority of them are bunched up around the mean, 68% approximately, and then 95% are within two standard deviations of the mean. And you'll have some outliers, like you roll the die five times and you get all sixes or all ones. And if you do this enough times, then you'll notice that your data is taken on the shape of a bell-shaped curve and it is therefore approximately normally distributed. So this is one example of why the sample mean is an unbiased estimator, and you can use a sample mean to go, okay, I predict that the population mean is this sample mean. You're gonna to wanna to keep track of which estimators you can do that for and which ones you cannot. To be a um, good statistician, you wouldn't want to use, for example, a median from a sample and then um, make a projection about the entire population's median based on that sample mean. Okay, section 6.4 is on the central limit theorem or CLT. The CLT is applied to problems about means that have a sample size not equal to one and um, I just want to note out or note for you that the square root of one is equal to one so you'll, I'll point out why I'm bringing that up later. But before we go to the next slide, I want you to copy and paste that link to this uh, fun video on the CLT um, into your navigation bar and watch this video. So pause my our video now and please watch that video. 
welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that video, um, Khan Academy Creature Cast on the Central Limit Theorem. It gives a great visual using um, bunnies and dragons, and um, it explains how the graph, the shape of the graph, so we, that we, we call that the distribution of the graph, changes. Um, and how the central limit theorem still allows us to calculate um, probabilities. Okay, before I go into showing you the complete general form of the central limit theorem, I like to sometimes just do an example applying the central limit theorem. Um, I think for learning purposes, that'll sometimes um, make the general portion seem not so overwhelming. And you can just refer back to the example and go, okay, I can do this. If I can get myself through this one example, yes, the general form, it seems more, more overwhelming, but um, example, one example at a time and I can get through this. Okay, an elevator has a maximum capacity of 16 passengers and a total weight of 2,500 pounds. If the passengers are all male, what is the probability of exceeding the weight limit? Males' weights have a normal distribution. So when I read that, when you guys read that, you need to sketch, when you read this right here, normal distribution, you need to sketch a bell-shaped curve. Don't take out a ruler. Don't try to make it perfect. Just sketch it, okay? Um, it says that the mean is 182.9 pounds. That lets me know that I'm working with x values, not z-scores. And I can put the 182.9 in the middle. So we have mu now. We have a standard deviation of 40.8. Not gonna graph all those intervals of standard deviations. Um, okay, so we're being asked if all passengers are male, what is the probability of exceeding the weight limit? Well, let's go about this by taking that weight limit of 2,500 uh, pounds, dividing it by the 16 passengers. We get 156.25. So let's figure out, well, what would the probability of randomly selecting one male and him weighing more than 156.25 pounds? Okay, we know how to do this. Central limit theorem is not coming into play. This is just review building up to the central limit theorem. So here's our 156.25 pounds. We're checking the probability that a male weighs greater than that, so we shade to the right. We're interested in this area right here because that area will be the probability. And in that case, which program do we run? I'll make it multiple choice for you. Inverse norm or normal CDF? If you chose normal CDF, you were correct. Shading starts at 156.25. It stops at, well, we don't know where. So I use a random 9999. Mu is 182.2 and sigma is 40.8. If we run that correctly, we should get 0.7431819 and so on. And so accurate to four decimal places, 0 0.7432. So to put that into perspective, about 74% of men weigh more than 156.25 pounds. Okay, now let's talk something more powerful, part B. Let's not just talk about one random male's weight. Let's talk about a sample of 16 males and their mean weight. Will that be more than the 156.25 pounds? And that's really what's gonna determine if the, pass, if the probability that if the passengers are all males, the weight limit is exceeded. Okay, so now we are talking 16 males. That means N equals 16. When you see something like this, I want you to ask yourself, hmm, should I be applying the central limit theorem to this question? All right, maybe you don't know the answer yet. So we draw our horizontal axis, the X there, 182.9 in the middle still, because that's our mean. Okay, now I'm about to draw the bell-shaped curve over top, but I recall from that creature cast video that when I'm talking about a sample of 16, my bell-shaped curve is going to become more narrow and um, taller. What that means is I can't keep my standard deviation the same. 
I need to shrink my standard deviation because more of the data is bunched up closer to the mean because the bell becomes more narrow and tall. Okay, so how much smaller do I need to make the standard deviation? And the answer is I take the current standard deviation and I divide it by the square root of n and that will be my new standard deviation. So in this problem, that would be my current standard deviation of 40.8 divided by the square root of 16. Okay. Now we're still talking about the 156.625. So that's still, I'm trying to make it still somewhat lined up with that. Uh, 156.25, no, 25. We're still going this direction, but you might notice that more of our bell-shaped curve is filled in, and that it would be correct um, because our standard deviation shrunk. Okay, so we're still looking for that shaded area, which means we run which program? If you said normal CDF, good job. Our, um, oops, oops, I forgot to write <laughs> the note that this problem, let me erase what's a, a covering that note. This problem is about means and the sample size is not one. So yes, we are going to apply the central limit theorem. Okay, so our shading starts at 156.25 still. It stops at a still a place we don't know, so I use 9999. Our mean is still the same, 182.9. The last input of standard deviation is the only thing that changes. It shrinks by, well, by dividing it by the square root of your sample size. Running that, we should get 0 0.995509.05 and so on. Accurate to four decimal places, that would be 0 0.9955. Do not get in that elevator. Let's put this into perspective. If you take a sample of 16 males, 99.5% of the time, if they all got in that elevator, the um, safety total weight limit of 2,500 pounds would be exceeded. And so although it was very useful information that 74% of males weigh more than that 156.25 uh, pounds that we're looking at. It's quite a bit more valuable, especially when we're talking about uh, the safety of um, any living being, to know that the probability of that elevator being exceeding the weight limit if all the passengers are males is 0 0.9955 is something that we um, cannot ignore. Okay, question for you. What is the only difference in the solutions to part A and part B on the previous slide? Pause this and rewind it if you need to, or just say out loud whatever you think that that only difference was. Okay, the answer is the standard deviation. That was the only difference. It changed from 40.8 to 40.8 over the square root of 16. So computation-wise, it looked very similar with that one adjustment in standard deviation. So to apply the central limit theorem, divide the standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. Now I wanna um, bring up why I talked about the square root of one being one. Well, the central limit theorem, you'll often hear it stated as sample size greater than one. But if your sample size was one, so you take your 40.8 standard deviation and you divide by the square root of one, you're dividing by one. So you're still getting the 40.8 standard deviation. So just something I wanted to point out there. Okay, here is the central limit theorem in its general form. If one and two are true, Number one being random variable x has any distribution with a mean of mu, standard deviation of sigma. And two, simple random samples, all of size n and not equal to one are selected. Then 
3, 4, and 5 also follow as true. Number 3, as the sample size, n, increases, the distribution of sample means approaches a normal distribution. All that means is that it, be, it starts to become a bell-shaped curve. Four, the mean of the sample means is the population mean. So don't change mu. Mu sub x bar is the same as mu. And five, the standard deviation of all sample means is sigma divided by the square root of n. So that's where your adjustment in the calculations uh, takes place. Okay, we've got an example. Um, please pause this video, read this example, and try it on your own. Welcome back. The length of time it takes to play an NBA game is normally distributed with a mean. Oh, I'm going to pause right there because I saw normally distributed. So I'm going to draw a bell-shaped curve. I'm going to make it a little higher because I think my animation is below this. Okay, there we go. Uh, with a mean of 137 minutes. So it didn't say mean equals zero. So I know I'm talking x values and I put that 137 in the middle. And standard deviation of 11 minutes. Um, 50 games are randomly selected, so that's our n, n equals 50. So you should be thinking, hmm, should I use the central limit theorem? My sample size is 50, and this problem is about means. So yes, we are going to want to apply the central limit theorem. Okay, so we're asked to find the probability that the sample mean is between 120 and 135 minutes. Let me graph that for you. Um, just make that the 120 say, and this the 135 say, like that. So we're being asked to find the probability between these two. You may not have needed this visual at this point. Between are the, is the nice one. We often don't as often need a visual. Um, but still want to give it to those who need it. So we are being asked to find this area. Well, we're being asked to find the probability, but the area will be the probability. Okay, program that we run is normal CDF. Oh, I'm all over the place. Okay, let me... Okay, normal CDF, our mu remains 137. Our standard deviation of sigma changes from uh, the original 11 to 11 divided by the square root of n, which is 50. So when you run normal CDF, your shading starts at 120, your shading stops at 135, your mean is 137, and your standard deviation is 11 divided by the square root of 50. And if you run that correctly, you should get 0 0.0992829 and so on. Last question, what percent of NBA games are between 2 hours and 2 hours and 15 minutes? Round to the nearest percent. And that would be about 10% of NBA games are between those two times. And that will finish our discussion and Chapter 6. I will see you guys next time to discuss Chapter 7. Have a great day. Thank you.